As you're coming in, we're going to go ahead and begin. We're glad you could be here. If you're joining us online, we're glad you're here as well. You can always come and visit us. And uh, if you're able to, let's stand. We're going to sing a new song, or a new song to us anyway, and it's just called Great Things. God, we know, does great things, and we see that in his word, and we'll see that as we hear it preached a little bit later on. Let's sing this together. You. He has done great things. You may be seated. I want to welcome you to First Baptist Church today. It is good to see you, to be with you. We are here for a purpose. Our purpose today is to glorify God, to point people to Jesus Christ, to fellowship with one another. These are the reasons that we're here. So we want you to experience that fellowship. We want you to experience uh, knowing Christ and being one with him. It's good to see you. Many of you, some of you I didn't get to welcome yet today. <clears throat> I look forward to talking with you at some point before you go home. 
Anyway, glad you're here. We want to catch you up on a few things that are going on in the life of our church this week alone. You're going to have an opportunity to have action-packed, fun-filled week at First Baptist Church. There's what's going on. Already, there's lots of red in the sanctuary and in the foyer. This is a reset by our visual arts team, and it's because it's a month of love, I'm sure. But we're going red in a big way on Wednesday night. Our fellowship meals are resuming at 515, and we're making it a telegrade and a celebration that we're going to the Super Bowl. So we want you to come in your chief's attire or wear red and help us have a tailgate that celebrates all that we have to celebrate as a community over the Super Bowl, but we have so much more to celebrate in our life with Jesus Christ, of course. So if you do come, know that. Then we have all of our regular evening activities on Wednesday, small groups for all ages, kids, all the way through adults. We've got something for you. We wouldn't want you to miss it. Then on uh, Thursday, we have a senior adults living triumphantly at 11 o'clock. They're going to be meeting in our fellowship hall. So if you're available and want to come and join that group, they would be very happy to have you, no matter what your age is. And then on Saturday, from 9 until 12, we're having this sanctuary open and the church will be open and you can come in and pray. It's just kind of a set-apart time for us to pray. There's much to be prayed about in the world, in our country, in our state. In, in our community, in our homes, and in our own lives. There's much to be prayed up. It's an invitation. Come join us and pray. Prayer walk the building. If the weather's nice, prayer walk the neighborhood. Just be intentional about praying. We invite you to come and pray with us. And then, of course, I wouldn't want you to miss coming back next Sunday. Same bat station, same bat place, okay, right here. We want you to come back. We enjoy fellowshipping with you and worshiping the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with you. With that, praise team, continue to lead us in worship today. From today's scripture, Psalm 85. Lord, you showed favor to your land. You restored the fortunes of Jacob. You forgave your people's guilt. You covered all their sin. Selah, you withdrew all your fury. You turned from your burning anger. Return to us, God, our salvation, and abandon the displeasure with us. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you prolong your anger for all generations? Will you not revive us again so that our people may rejoice in you? Show us your faithful love, Lord, and give us your salvation. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you have never failed me yet Amen. You can stand if you're able and sing this with us. Waiting for change. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battle's won For you have never failed me yet Your promise still stands Great is your faithfulness Your faithfulness I'm still Yeah. 
power in Jesus' name. Let's just sing that out. Jesus, your name is power. Jesus, your name is mine. Jesus, your name will break every stronghold. Jesus, your name is life. Jesus, your name is healing. Jesus, your
Voices one last time on that first verse. A little slower. Jesus, your name is power. Jesus, your name is might. Jesus, your name will break every stronghold. Jesus, your name is life. Amen. You can be seated. Someone's coming to lead us in prayer. I actually, there he comes. John is coming. We'll take it the offering, and when we sing this next song. Heavenly Father, we give thanks today for everyone who's joined us here at home, friends and family. We pray for everybody's health and wellness and things throughout the world. Just know we can do all things through Christ in your strength. Amen.
make a sinful one. To make a sinful one like me, your chosen precious child. You're chosen. Your chosen precious child. Lord, we thank you for what you did for us, even when we don't realize it. Lord, help us not ever get over that, but help us show our love and worship to you as we continue even now. Just hearing your word preached with our hearts in the right place. Help us apply what Mike preaches from your word into our hearts and changes as individuals and as a church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well, I'm very pleased to be with you today. I hope that you are feeling and sensing the Spirit of the Lord in this place. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We're going to be in His Word. That's one of the ways that we celebrate. We're in Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 11. We'll be going to the end of the chapter. We're in a series called The Acts of the Apostles, and I want to remind you as I have each week that we've been in this series, there are the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostles of the First Generation Church. This is the First Generation Church working in the power of the Holy Spirit. So all the things that we see occurring, we want to be mindful that it's a work of the Holy Spirit with His people. Uh, we did take a pause last week, and uh, we had a guest speaker, but when we were together two weeks ago, we looked at the first half of this chapter. It was a miracle in the making. It was uh, Peter and John were on their way to prayers at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to the temple, and they encountered a lame man who had been lame for, since birth, and he was 40 years old. And he's at the temple gate, beautiful, and he's begging. He's wanting alms. And he's expecting alms, and he's there every day. And everyone in Jerusalem basically knew him. They'd seen him in that spot. They'd known the man. It had been 40 years. And last time we were on this topic, we mentioned how Peter and John, while they had a common faith, and they had a common mission, and they had a common love for Christ, and they were busy uh, working and partnering to, there had been a, a birth of the church and, and there were thousands of people coming to Christ and they needed to be discipled and taught what the teachings the apostles had to be taught to them. And so they are still making a matter of prayer a priority. And that was one of the things that they had taught. We can look at Acts chapter 2 at the end of that chapter when the church was born and there's these 3,000 new believers and all the works that they're doing. But these two men, although they had much in common, they were still different. And we talked about those differences and those commonalities and that they were a representation that we are to see ourselves as the church partnering together with different gifts, with different spiritualness. Um, and, and we have a different spiritual ability Natural abilities, we have differences, but we come together and they're, they're partnering in all of this ministry and they're on their way to prayer. And they encounter the lame man and he's asking for alms. And Peter says, uh, silver and gold we do not have, but what we have we give to you. And we reached out his hand and raised the man up and he was able to walk. And it was a miraculous healing. Now, we pick up the story, the healing has happened, and what we aren't 100% sure of here is did they go on into the temple and have that prayer, or, and then as they're coming out, we're picking up the scene, or are they making their way into the temple to have their prayer, and the crowd is in the courtyard um, before they even get into the temple to pray. Most kind of look at it as they had, the, they had their prayer, and this is when they're coming out. <clears throat> So I want to read that passage with you, and then we'll uh, talk through it. And then we have a worship bulletin of sorts to guide you through some of our takeaways. If you do not have one, we still have them available at our entrances. And those will be the takeout points that we hope to review together at the conclusion of our, our message today. So reading from Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 11. While the man held on to Peter and John, 
So he'd just been healed, and he is clinging to them. And that, that just seems like a right thing to do for a, a, someone who has had this life-changing event to hang on to those who brought that. It was through them that he received that. And all the people were astonished and came running to them in the place called Solomon's Colonnade or Solomon's Portico. And when Peter saw this, he said to them, Fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? Why do you stare at us as if by our own power or our godliness we made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the God of our fathers has handed him over, whom you handed over, uh, excuse me, has glorified his servant Jesus, who you handed over him to be killed, and you disowned him before Pilate. Though he had decided to let him go, you disowned the holy and righteous one and asked that a murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through him that has completely healed him, as you can see. Now, fellow Israelites, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did your leaders. But this is how God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets, saying that his Messiah would suffer. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord, that he may send the Messiah who has been appointed for you, even Jesus. Heaven must receive him until the time comes for God to restore everything, as he has promised long ago through his holy prophets. For Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen to him will be completely cut off from their people. Indeed, beginning with Samuel, all the prophets who have spoken have foretold these days. And you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant of God made with you, your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. Then God raised up his servant, and he sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your wicked ways. So in this, I want to set up uh, uh, that this was an opportunity for Peter to preach. And this is the excerpts of that sermon. This miracle that had been in the making, this miracle of the lame man was an opportunity for Peter to preach. And all the crowd had gathered in and he saw that opportunity. And it was an opportunity that was set up by the Holy Spirit. A miracle that was done by the Holy Spirit, by Jesus an opportunity to preach that came from the Holy Spirit, a boldness to preach and an ability to preach in Peter on this occasion and on this day. And he's actually preaching some hard message to his audience. Yes, they're astonished, but he's going to point out to them their sin. He's going to point out their sin and their rejection of Jesus, and these are the same people that had rejected Jesus some 50-some days before that had yelled out, crucify him, crucify him. He's preaching with a boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit. And I want us to see that as we come to this passage as an opportunity to preach that has come and is empowered by the Holy Spirit. But I also want us to see that it's set up a juxtaposition. There is Peter in the same verses saying on the one hand, look, look at the goodness the greatness, the godness of Christ. And the same verses. But you disowned him. You denied him. You gave him up to be murdered. You killed him. The same verses. Playing against each other. And then as we get through the passage, he ultimately gives the invitation. Repent. This doesn't have to be this way. You can have a new view, a new relationship with Jesus. You can have a new thinking about who he is and what he has done. And so this is going to set up that invitation to repent. And what all of that means. Let's go through some of these verses and look at the juxtaposition. The goodness, the greatness, the godness of Christ against the guilt of the people. So in verse 12... We right off have Peter saying, hey, 
Why are you astonished? Why are you staring? Why are you surprised? Why are you coming out here to run? Why are you looking at me as if I have done this thing? And there's a good takeaway for you and for me. That if we do something in our strength, in our resources, in our power, it is going to be fatal. Fatal in this way, it's going to have a very limited power. It's going to have a very limited energy. It's going to have a very limited time span. It's not going to be lasting. It's not everlasting by any means. It might be a help for a moment. It might be a Band-Aid. But it is not going to have the power of Christ. So it's real important that we do our best in our lives and following Jesus Christ to allow Christ, the, the Holy Spirit, to work in our lives to manifest himself because that's where the real power is. That the power isn't in me, it isn't in you, and it's not in you and me together. It is in you and me together through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus Christ. So Peter, right off, make no mistake, it isn't me, and it's not even my companion, John, and it's not even my companion and I together. No, it is Jesus. It is Jesus. So he's right off, Jesus heals Jesus is the power who did it. It's not our power. We recall that in the healing, when Peter healed him, he reached out his right hand. And we know that Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father. And there's significance in the right hand, that it's the right hand of righteousness. So it is in the righteousness of Christ and the power of Christ and the work of the Holy Spirit that this man is able to be healed. It's not because of anything that Peter has done or anything that Peter can do outside of the power of Christ, and he is claiming it, and he is naming it, and he says it's Jesus who did it. Jesus heals. In verse 13, he refers to Jesus as the servant, the servant of God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This God did it. We know of Jesus they knew of Jesus. They had, it had been foretold in the, in the prophets, and specifically we are familiar with Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. By his wounds we are healed. We know that Christ came as a servant to save us. He came in obedience to the Father. He came with a sacrificial servant heart. He came with a desire to see us redeemed, to be purchased, and our debt, sin debt to be paid. So who did it? Who healed? Jesus, the servant whom you have heard about, who has been taught to you. Jesus, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, he's the one who's done it. It's interesting that they were going into prayers, and in their prayer services they have 18 different benedictions. Two of the 18 benedictions that they would pray in a Hebrew prayer, prayer service was the nature of God, who he is, the authority, the power of God. One of the other benedictions that they would pray is the healing of, of God. If he saves, then you're saved. Because through him is the power, and in him alone is the power. So they see that Jesus is servant. Jesus is God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Verse 14, Jesus, the holy and righteous one. Who did it? Who did it? Jesus, the holy and righteous one, did it. Not Peter, not John, not the church as a whole, but the holy and righteous one. Verse 15, Jesus, some versions of text will call this uh, the prince of life or the author of life. He did it. You know, the one who created life and gave life and breathed life into us. The one who came from heaven and lived a life on earth. The one who went to the cross, died for our sins, was buried, but death couldn't hold him down. He had victory over death. He gave life. He's the creator of life. He's the prince of life. He's the author of life. So who did it? He did it. The author of the prince of life did it. He's the life leader. He's the life leader for you and for me. Following the leader, the leader, the leader. I'm following the leader wherever he may go. Follow the life leader. He did it. You want to see change and transformation? You want to see healing and recovery? You want to see restoration? You want things to be different and better? 
with a lasting, meaningful, powerful effect. Not a fatal, temporary, oh, I did it, but I can't keep doing it, and I've run out of money, I've run out of energy, I've run out of time, I, it's expired. Throw it in the trash, it's no good anymore. If you want this transformation, then you follow the life leader. He did it, he did it. Verse 16, Jesus who gives us faith did it, faith through him. The man had been a beggar. He'd been asking for alms. He'd been lame and would now completely healed. You might be familiar with the Phil Welcome song. I think it's the house of the Lord. We were beggars. Now we are royalty. We were beggars. We were alms. We were asking for alms. We were asking for a little silver, a little of gold. Oh, but Jesus came and gave us so much more. What I have, I give to you. And he reached down his righteous right hand and he picked us up and he healed us and he transformed us and he changed us. And he gave us a new walk, all right. A new walk in Jesus Christ. A new walk of being restored and redeemed and purchased and paid out and paid up and fully recovered in Jesus Christ. It does not diminish that there is some value to silver and gold if used properly and rightly and if it's we recognize that it all comes from the Lord and we are to be good stewards of what he has given us and the resources and that he blesses and he provides through it and he guides us. There's a little goodness there. But not the complete goodness of God, not the complete power of God. He is not wanting us to trust in silver and gold. No. I'm reminded <clears throat> that we need to be careful. We need to be careful in what we trust in and what what we even trust in as a church. Here's what I mean. What Peter and John said, what I have to you, I give to you. In the name of Jesus, be healed, basically. Here's what I know. There is so much that is a distractor to believers today. But let's look at some of the distractors that the church might get involved in. I'm not saying there is no value in these things, but they need a proper place. There, there are distractors today of how many views and likes do we have. There is a distractor of um, our programs, and they are just that, programs. Church on the Porch, it's a program. Vacation Bible School, it's a program. You know what saves, what heals, what changes lives is Jesus Christ. If we're using programs, we need to be led by the Holy Spirit, guided by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, be using the programs to point everybody to Jesus. Because that's the thing that saves, that's the thing that lasts, that's the thing that changes, that's the thing that is everlasting. So who did it? Who did it? Not Peter, not John. Jesus did it. We were beggars, now we're royalty. Who did it? Verse 18, Jesus the Messiah who suffered, he did it. He did it as it was foretold through the prophets that a servant would come and he would be Messiah, he would be Savior. He did it. He heals. He healed this man. He healed this man by an ordained, appointed time of God for the purpose of glorifying God, pointing people to Christ. There was a purpose to the healing it did draw people's attention and created an opportunity for Peter to preach so that he could give them something that was much, much more significant than a little, little silver and gold, a little coin, a little, little, little money. Something that was much more significant than a program. Something that is much more significant and that is we give you Faith through Jesus Christ. We give you salvation through Jesus Christ. We, we give you the gospel news, the gospel message. Mm. So let's juxtapose this goodness of God, greatness of God, godness of Christ that Peter is pointing out uh, to their, their guilt. So he calls it out. 
in verse 13, he says, You gave him up to be killed and disowned him before Pilate, though Pilate had already decided to let him go. You gave him up. You disowned him. Mm. This is in verse 13, Jesus, the servant of God, Jesus, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus. Jesus of the ages, Jesus of the Father, Jesus of our forefathers, Jesus, the one who was with them at the day of creation, the one that they had been promised, the one that they could have known about, could have read about. But they're guilty. You decided to let him go. You disowned him. You denied him. Verse 14. Again, this word disowned or denied the holy and righteous one in exchange for a murderer. It's been said, it's been pointed out that in these two verses, 13 and 14, that there seems to be an emphasis on the part of Peter for disowning or denying Christ. And I wonder why. It was only 50 some odd days before that that he had denied Christ himself. So he gets it. He had denied Christ three times, and he's pointing out how they denied and disowned Christ. And he's, through that, through the work of the Holy Spirit in this scripture that is for us to read and to learn from today, saying, hey, hello there. How have I, how have you disowned, denied Christ? It happens. That's part of our sin nature to deny Christ. But look here. They denied him over and opposed to a murderer. Now, it's a little bit hard for me to get my head around that. It's a little bit hard for me to get my head around that, except I do know human nature. They gave up the Son of God They gave up their Messiah. They gave up their Savior. They gave up the one that was full of love, mercy, and grace. They gave him up. They gave the prince of life, the author of life, they gave him up. They gave him up for a murderer. So I'm reminded. What do I trade Christ out for? You know, when I am tempted to deny him and disown him, what do I trade him out for? It is true. You see it. Maybe you feel it sometimes. There's so much hate and disdain and division and party and politic and team that is causing us to hate one another. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount made it perfectly clear. That in and of itself is murder in your heart. They traded out the prince of life, the giver of life, the hope in all things. They traded him out for a murderer. And before we're too quick to say, well, I wouldn't do that. Well, Jesus said, If you did it in your heart, you're guilty. I want to be careful about disowning Christ, denying Christ, trading him out, because he is, there is not a good, there is not a good option. I don't win, I don't win if I change out Christ for something else. If I trade him out for something else, I'm I'm not going to win. That's a losing proposition. You gave him up, you disowned him, you exchanged him for a murder. Verse 15, you killed the author of life. You killed him, but God raised him from the dead. You killed him, but Jesus has victory over death. You killed him, but our hope for victory over death comes from the same Jesus. You killed him, And now he sits at the right hand of the the Father. And why do you wonder 
who did this as if I had done it? Peter is thinking and saying to them, do you not even remember? I mean, when he was on earth, you saw him cast out demons. You saw him heal every kind of disease. You saw him feed the thousands from little or nothing. You heard him speak with authority and teach. In one instance, he healed from a distance when the centurion came and he had a servant and he wanted Jesus to come and heal him and go to the house and be... A, it didn't require and does not require that Jesus would be in that place in his incarnate form to touch and to heal. Now, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father today for the purpose of interceding for you and for me, to prepare a place for us to get ready for his return. He's coming back. He wants us to be ready. He wants us to be his ambassadors, his emissaries, while we are waiting to be at work about the business of sharing and spreading this good news. Jesus saves. He heals. Verse 15, the author of life, that you, you have killed him, but God has raised him from the dead, and he could not stay dead. And Peter is standing there, and I'm saying I'm a witness of that. I'm a firsthand witness. I'm speaking to you, and I've got hundreds of others of people who have seen him risen from the dead. He lives today, and he, heal, he heals today. He heals today. Do you not know that the same Jesus this same God that cast out demons, healed diseases, fed the thousands. This same God is still parting seas and rolling away stones and resurrecting people from the dead. Do you not know that he has the power, that he has the authority, that he is the one who heals? Do you not know that he is the one we need to own and not disown? He is the thing we need to exchange out our life for, for his life. For the things that appeal to us, for the things that bless us. You killed the author of life. Jump down to verse 17. It talks about their ignorance. Now, fellow Israelites, or in some, some versions it says uh, brethren. Now, they're not brothers in Christ, but they're fellow Israelites. Hebrews or fellow Israelites, now fellow Israelites. And he's been laying these charges against them. He's laying this guilt that they own. They can't deny this is their guilt. And he's ameliorating it with now brothers, now fellow Hebrews, now fellow Israelites. And, you know, kind of softening the sting a little bit. But their ignorance and our ignorance doesn't mean that it does not matter. Our ignorance and their ignorance does not mean that there are not consequences for our choices. When we exchange out Christ, the author of life, for murder, when we deny him, when we disown him, when we choose something else over him, when we make something else matter more than him, and even a well-intentioned, good program matter more than him. So I'm reminded of a couple of illustrations that I want to share about ignorance. One is that I, that I use quite often is the ignorance of I'm walking in the park. Well, I've been walking for a while, and it's a hot day, and I see a bench over in the shade. I'm thirsty. I got my bottle of water. I want to get a sip of it. I'm going to sit down on that bench just to catch my breath and, and, and quench my thirst and get a little shade. But there's a sign. Do not sit here. Okay? Well, I look around. There's nobody else. I don't see what the big deal is. So I sit there. And then I find out why. Do not sit there because What? Wet paint. Okay. Now, I've got lots of illustrations like that, but for the sake of time, I'm going to cut to one that's a little bit more serious and kind of gets to the, my point more significantly. At least two, new, uh, two news outlets this week have told about 
a man who died from eating a pufferfish, a blowfish. Now, if you did not know, if, if I may say, if you are ignorant about pufferfishes, as I kind of was, but now I'm informed, they're very toxic. They are up to 1,200 times more toxic than cyanide. Mm. And yet, in some parts of the world, they are a delicacy. Japan happens to be one of those places in the world where they are a delicacy. And if you're going to fix pufferfish, you have to know how to fix it so it doesn't kill you. So in Japan, they talk about having a four to ten year apprenticeship to learn how to fix pufferfish, blowfish, properly. Okay? Now, I don't know about you, but I don't, know if, I don't care how long you've been in an apprenticeship, I don't think I'm going to accept pufferfish anymore. Well, not that I ever did. Besides, there's a lot of other things that I like a lot, like Rocky Road ice cream, that doesn't take any special training. Now, here's the deal. The man received the, man received the pufferfish as a Christmas gift. Now, interestingly, the one who gave it to him has not been disclosed. Okay? All right. So he received a gift as a Christmas gift because maybe they're thinking, wow, I'm giving you a delicacy. You're going to really like this puffer fish. It must be really good, right? And so he takes the liver out. He boils it. He takes it out. He puts lemon on it. He eats it. He shares some with a buddy. Five weeks later, after having a code blue, seizures, being put on the ventilator, five weeks later, he dies. That's why it hit the news this week. His buddy, miraculously, hasn't died from it, but he has neurolo neurological deficit, walking deficit, somehow has survived it. But here's the point. The point into the passage of they were ignorant. They were ignorant because they didn't really realize. They had reason to know who Christ was. They had seen Christ and heard about his works while he was incarnate and walking among them. And yet they disowned him and denied him and changed him out for a murderer, Barabbas. At some level, they were completely ignorant to the goodness, greatness, godness of Christ. You know, whatever I think Christ is, and I have a high, high value of Christ, whatever I think Christ is, he is greater than I can imagine. He's more powerful than I can imagine. He has more authority than I can imagine. He has more love and grace and mercy than I can imagine. He is more. He is more. More than I can imagine. And they didn't imagine enough of the goodness of God and the greatness of God and the godness of Christ, their Messiah, their Savior. So here's the deal. The devil works this way. Devil delicacies seem so good. They seem like, I, I need a little bit of that. I'm going to get a little bit of that. They seem like, oh, it's not going to hurt anybody. It's going to be all right. It's just me, myself, and I, and nobody else is going to know. Here's the way devil delicacies work. They're poison. They're poison. And it may seem okay in a moment, but they fail to count the cost. They fail to count the consequence. Now, I wish I had some better illustrations. If I had taken more time, I might have. But here's the deal. 
And maybe you can't relate to this, but I hope you can apply it to your situation in life. Oh, I didn't think that having a drink and then driving would have this consequence. Now, what's the worst kind of consequence you can imagine? I just took this little drink, and I did not feel, I did not feel inebriated. I did not feel compromised. I didn't feel like it was going to keep me from driving safely. And what the worst consequence? And we can't take these things back. They're not reversible. We can't take these things back. I don't know what yours is. But I know there's a devil delicacy tempting you because that's what the devil does. You can't take back. I got in that car and I drove and there was an accident and someone died. Okay, there are consequences. They seem like a little distractor, innocent enough, harmless enough. But if they're from the devil, this is what they're going to do. They're going to kill, steal, and destroy. So those puffer fishes that are a delicacy, maybe we shouldn't, maybe we shouldn't imbibe participate. Maybe we need to be a little bit more informed about what God calls us to do as men and women of God, as Christ followers. Mm. So Jesus heals is what I want us to know. And Peter has set all of this up, the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the godness of Christ, against their guilt and their ignorance. And there is no excuse. We know better. Sometimes we don't understand it, like why can't I sit on the park bench? But in our head, I know better. The sign says, don't sit here. Well, then I probably ought to not sit there until I understand better. So, this is all set up. Peter had this great opportunity to preach to this crowd that was, you know, rushing and running and staring and surprised. And what's happened here? This man's been healed. And Peter had this wonderful opportunity through the power of the Holy Spirit to speak in ways that he hadn't prior to the Holy Spirit coming on him on the day of Pentecost. He hadn't spoken this way before. He's speaking. He's pointing them to something much more important. Not that the man's physical healing doesn't matter, because it does matter. Not that a little silver and gold can't be useful and put to good use for the kingdom of God and the power of God in the name of Christ, because it can. But it needs to be pointing people to the thing that matters the most. Jesus heals. Jesus saves. Jesus restores us. He redeems us. He delivers us out of our sin and brings us into a right relationship with the good and holy God. So he calls them to repent in verse 19. Verse 19. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. Now, it's interesting. It's interesting here, this invitation to repent, and I'm reminded of a couple of things, and one is just this week, <clears throat> a pastor that I'm aware of was called to repent for something that he said. Now, he's a popular pastor. Many of you would know who he is if I gave his name. There's much to admire about this man, Pastors are not above the rank and file. Okay? 
which is not. And nor should we want to be held above the rank and file. We're sinners saved, in need of a savior. By the grace of God, he snatches me up and he heals me from the inside out. Now, I'm not even going to tell you the man's name. I'm not even going to tell you whether I think he was right or whether he was wrong. If you know the story, you know the story. But my point is that he is being called to repent for something he said. And my point is this. A man that I hold in high value, higher, I, I esteem him more than me, said, I go to the Lord and repent daily for things that I say and things that I've done. Here's the takeaway. Repentance isn't a one and done. There is a repentance. There is a repentance that saves. There is a, and then when you are his, you are his, and he owns you, and he will not let go of you, and he will walk with you, and he will abide with you, and he'll journey with you, and in your misery of this life, he will be there with you, and I can't imagine going through the trials and troubles that happen in this life without Christ being there with me and giving me hope and giving me strength and laying claim to his promises. I can't imagine. I just can't imagine. But we're on a journey. We're not in our resurrected bodies yet. We're on a journey. And this pastor says, I need to come and pray, uh, ask for repentance daily. And then I'm reminded of the seven churches that Jesus spoke to in Revelation. You know the story, right? Seven churches in the book of Revelation. Five of those churches, you know... They, they were the game. They were the pillar churches back in their day, back in their time. They were the pillar church. Five of the seven churches. Jesus says to them, you need to repent. Repentance isn't a one and done. It is a change. It is saying, I value Christ more than silver and gold. I value Christ more than my physical health, although I do value my physical health. I value Christ. I'm going to follow Christ. He's the true healer, the lasting healer, the all power and all authority. But it calls these five churches to repent. The first one is Ephesus. Why? Because they had lost their first love. Their first love had been Christ. To love them, love him with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. To love Christ. And then to love others from that. But somewhere along they lost their first line. I don't know what they traded out Christ with for, for what. I don't know. Maybe it's that live stream count. Maybe it's that internet hit. I don't know what they traded out for. Attendance at VBS? I don't know. Attendance at church on the porch? I don't know. What did they trade it out for? Because the most important thing, the key Jesus calls them out for, is love me. I'm your Lord. I'm the one who heals. I'm the one who saves. I'm the power. I'm the authority. Everything that you're doing is supposed to be pointing people to me. I don't know. But repent. If he's not your first love. Pergamon. Well, Calls them out. They had allowed false teaching and false doctrine, and they didn't stay with the truth that they knew. They hadn't stayed with the apostles' teachings. They hadn't stayed with the Word of God. And whenever we dilute down or water down or soften up or change it to make it just, you know, scratch someone's ears a little bit better, every time we do that, well, then it's, it's just, frankly, and this is harsh, I'm sorry. Not sorry. Whenever we do that, I'm going to put a little water in it and dilute it down. It won't, it, won't, it won't feel so bad. Put a little more water in it, dilute it down. Whenever we do that, it loses its power. And when it loses its power, it's just trash. So if our doctrine isn't right, if our doctrine isn't coming from this, if our doctrine isn't coming from the Holy Spirit, You can go drink some other Kool-Aid. This has got no power. 
If it isn't this, it's of no use at all. Well, that's what they were accused of. Jesus said, repent. This is to the church. Church of Pergamon. Thyatira. Calls them to repent. There was a one, probably a false prophetess, who was leading them into immorality and false teachings. So a false teacher, teaching false things, condoning immorality, leading people into, in, into immorality. And Jesus said, what? What? Repent. Sardis. They had a reputation of being alive in Christ, alive in the Holy Spirit, in the power of the Holy Spirit. They were alive. Oh, yeah. But now, he finds them spiritually dead. He says, come to life. Repent. Have a change. Come back. Reclaim. Mm. And then the one we know so well, Laodicea. The lukewarm. Not running hot, not running cold. I don't want to, I don't want to upset anybody over here. I don't want to upset anybody over there. We'll just try and run in the middle here. Be lukewarm about our faith. Run in the middle about what the word of God says. What's Jesus say? That is no good. That's no good. Repent. Repent. Church, repent. So, repentance isn't a one and done. Repentance isn't just for the individual. Repentance is for the church also. Now, I don't know what the Lord is laying on your heart that is distracting you, that is a devil delicacy, that is causing you to change your priorities in a way that puts God second or third or fourth in your life? I don't know. But the scripture teaches and informs us that you probably have one or more than one. And I don't know what you need to turn from, have a change about, have a refocus, have a revisioning of, having a recapturing it and holding it fervently and holding it tight in the power of Christ and the power of the Holy. I don't know what you need to repent from, but it's not a one and done. And the scripture informs us so that we are not ignorant. I cannot claim I did not know that there's probably something on a daily basis before we lay our head down or when we rise in the morning that we can start our morning out with, Lord... I said something I didn't mean to say. I did something I shouldn't have done. I looked at something I know better than. I missed that opportunity to share the goodness, the greatness of God with somebody. I didn't share the gospel and I didn't even hand him a dollar bill. Forgive me, Lord. Continue to work in me and make me into your likeness and into your image and into your love and into your mercy and into your grace and your power to flow through me. That's just the way of living when he's first. So, Jesus heals. So if you have your worship bulletin today, let's go through the takeaways First, when Jesus heals, he has the power, the authority. He is the servant of God. He is the righteous one, the author of life, the one who suffered for us so that we could be healed. Paul, I'm drawing a blank on the passage, but makes a, a statement that infers that, uh, and this is held up in extra biblical sources as well, but when people were nailed to the cross, their crime, their sin against mankind was nailed to the cross with them. Jesus had no sin when he was nailed to the cross. So when we look at the guilt, the disowning, the denying, the exchanging Jesus out that the Hebrew people did, we are also to look and see and be reminded, hey, 
The Romans were there too. Hey, you know and I know we're not ignorant of this. That we nailed him to the cross as well. So the only thing that was nailed to the cross with Jesus was all of our sin. The scripture says in verse 19 that we were reading today that because he went to the cross, our sins are wiped out. It's an interesting comment. Because in the day that this was written, they were using papyrus or parchment and a certain ink, and the two did not have an acid. Either the parchment didn't or the ink didn't, and so it did not bind to the, to the papyrus or to the parchment. It did not bind there. So when the scripture says it will be wiped out, or in some versions it says blotted out, it would only take a wet cloth and put it on that parchment, and it would be as if it was never there. You see, there's a different power in being wiped out as if it was never there than it's been redacted. It's been marked through. It's been struck through. There's a different significance. There's a different power in that it's as if it was never there. So when Jesus went to the cross, the only sins that were nailed to the cross with him were ours. And because he went to the cross and I've received him as my Lord and Savior and because of his broken body and shed blood, it's as if it was never there. I am restored. I am redeemed. I am brought out of this sin and brought into a right relationship with Christ. Praise be to God. Second bullet point, Jesus heals. In our sin, he died for us. In our ignorance, he died for us. He came for one purpose only. And that was to show his grace, his mercy, and love and to provide a way for us to be atoned for, redeemed, restored, delivered from sin, and brought into new life with Jesus Christ, to walk in newness of life with Jesus Christ. And we cannot be ignorant. Ignorance doesn't mean it doesn't matter. Ignorance doesn't mean that there still are not consequences. Jesus heals when we turn our hearts to him. He heals. When we claim his as our own savior, he blots out our sin. It's wiped away. We're restored. And then Jesus heals through, and through his healing, we are blessed. And maybe this is what I should have started with, is all of the blessings that come by being restored with him. If it starts in verse 19, your sins will be wiped out. You'll have refreshing that'll come from the Lord. He will send his Messiah. He's coming back. Heaven is going to hold him until he comes back. And he comes back, verse 21, he's going to restore everything as he promised. Verse 22, he will raise you up. He will raise up a prophet who's going to raise you up and restore you. And anyone who does not listen to him will be cut off, but you'll be saved from the judgment. You'll be saved from the judgment. This is a blessing. You'll be saved from that judgment if you've been restored by him. And he has made us co-heirs with himself. He has made us co-heirs with him, and when he returns and restores, we'll be a part of that. And lastly, it says, verse 26, he raised up his sermon, servant and sent him to you so that you could turn from your wicked ways. Well, that's our call to know that the church has a role in healing. And Jesus is the one who heals. He's the one who did it. And our response as individuals and as a church is to make sure that we're walking rightly with our Lord and Savior. Keep him our priority. Give him our love. Share and show that love to others. Nothing else matters as much Nothing else matters as much. Well, we're going to close in prayer, and Alan and the praise team is going to come and lead us in our closing today. So, Heavenly Father, Mighty God, Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, thank you for your mercies, for your grace, for your love, that you're the God who heals. You are the God who heals. Whatever brokenness I have, you restore me. Whatever sin debt I have, you pay it off. 
whatever devil delicacy is tempting me and distracting me, then you just break it and you shatter it and you show me a different path, a different way of mercy, grace, and glory of walking and abiding in you and showing your love and mercy and grace to others. As the evil spreads, so too can we stop the evil from spreading and we can spread love and mercy and grace and the word of God. And we are to be your emissaries and ambassadors. We're to take that message to those who are lost, those who are hurting, those who are seeking, those who are empty, those who are in despair and depression, those who are in an addiction, those who are in broken relationships, who don't have meaning and purpose in their lives, wondering what this, is, this day is about. What is the purpose of this day? What is the meaning of my life? That you would point us and restore us and redeem us and deliver us, that you are the God who does that. You are the only one who has the power to heal us. We claim that healing. I pray each of us and every one of us and together as a church family, we claim it in the name of Jesus Christ and through the power of Jesus Christ and the hope of Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's stand, let's sing, let's respond. I kept you out over time. I thank you for your time. You are my favorite First Baptist Church of North Kansas City and I am so glad that you spent your time with us today worshiping God. I've carried a burden for long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation. My soul burns a 
Before we dismiss, I want to again say how delighted, how pleased, how much it warms my heart to see you here, to have you here. If I haven't had a chance to speak with you or meet with you and you'd like to come up and say something to me or ask for prayer, you still may. I'll be up here in the front for a while to do that. And I want to send you out with this passage of scripture that's at the bottom of the worship bulletin that comes from Isaiah. Therefore the Lord waits to be gracious to you. And therefore he exalts himself to show mercy to you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all of those who wait for him. He's a good, good God. Amen. Amen. My heart has been in your sight long before my